Welcome to Lost or Live. It is May 24th, 2017, and we are so honored and humbled that you decided to join us tonight. My name is Travis Yates. I'm the editor-in-chief of Lobster.com. And we're going to ask you to do us a big favor before we get started with this incredible show with an incredible topic today. And that is we want you to spread this show around. If you're watching us on Facebook, please hit that share button and send that around. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the link and send to your friends, maybe on Twitter, just forward around. It's the only show for law enforcement, by law enforcement, and we give very critical narratives and context to real issues that very few people are talking about. And we're so honored to have the platform, but we also want as many people as possible to be able to watch it. And of course, this would not be possible if it wasn't for our wonderful sponsor, WatchGuard Video. Uh, we love WatchGuard Video. This is the fourth episode they have sponsored for us. They have one more to go, and you won't want to miss next week because Stacey Etel will be live in studio with WatchGuard. But WatchGuard Video is an incredible company with not only body camera uh, technology, but also in-dash camera technology. They're the largest manufacturer in the country. Over 6,000 police departments use their technology. Uh, all of it is made right here in the USA. And why we love them so much and why we've partnered with them is because of their ethics and their values and their character. Over 25% of all their profits goes to charity. And if you go to their website, it won't take you long to find out that they believe in a servant leadership based model. Uh, we just love everything that they stand for. And we love what they have come out with here recently, which is their leadership behind the line training series. And that is they're going to cities all over America doing free leadership training uh, with free lunches too and they're just doing it because I mean quite frankly they're doing it because they care about law enforcement. I, I'll tell you right now from a marketing standpoint they're not out there selling a bunch of, of body cameras and technology but they they saw the need to expose some of the lack of leadership in law enforcement so uh, they're using uh, Stacy Tell as one of their trainers uh, he's been going across the country with them telling his story of course you've heard his story first here on Lawster.com, uh, but we are so honored to partner with them. And tonight, you're going to watch the third part of the Stacey Tell story. So let me back up and tell you how this even came about. We wrote the original story called the Stacey Tell story. You can see that at StaceyTell.com. It goes straight to our website where that article is. And out of that article, WatchGuard Video sees it, and they say they think to themselves, we need to put this in a video form. And so they developed a three-part video series revolving around this article. And we have shown those exclusively to you here the last three episodes of Lofts are Live. We showed you the trailer, and then the last two weeks we showed you part one, and then last week part two. So if you are watching this and you have not seen the first parts of the Stacey Tell story, you're going to be okay. You can still watch part three right here in a minute, and you can go back later right here on Lobster Live and watch the first two parts of the Stacey Tell story. It is some of the most impactful, most powerful video you will ever see. It, must, it should be mandatory viewing for every law enforcement officer in the world, and really every citizen in the world. It is incredible because you see what the media and what lack of leadership can do to a human being. And I call Stacy a human being because we so often are not seen as human beings. But that's exactly what they did. They set out to destroy Stacy. And man, we are proud to say that with the help of me in our audience and with the help of WatchGuard and with the help of Vicki Newman who wrote that initial article, Stacy Tell is traveling the country as I speak, telling his story in an effort to keep that from happening ever again. So without further ado, this is the third part of a three-part series, the last video in the video series of Stacey Tell you're about to watch. Next week, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, be right back here on Law Officer Live, and you're going to see Stacey Tell live in studio telling that story and talking about everything that's happened to him since being in our studio a little over a year ago. So without further ado, part three of the Stacey Tell story. You become the guy with leprosy. Nobody wants to be around you. So you lose all your contacts, you lose all your friends. Everybody thinks that whatever you say is not what happened. They only feed off of what they read. In law enforcement in general, we have, a, we have a tendency to eat our own. We separate ourselves from those that are accused right out of the gate without knowing any facts. It's just a scary deal. And then our value outside of there is zero. We have no value at that point.
in my wildest dreams, I couldn't have imagined that they were going to fire him. That was not reprimanded maybe. I couldn't see how they could have twisted everything that my um, brain had wrapped itself and comprehended. I couldn't see how they could have twisted all of that to firing him. Nothing, no, none of that made sense. See, what people don't know is if they couldn't fire me because they didn't do anything wrong. They could not renew me because I had a contract that said there was no just cause for non-renewal, but they couldn't fire me. If they could have fired me, they would have fired me. They didn't have the ability to do that. But the media wrote that I was fired. So now what happens is I carry the word Stacy Tell fired as the headline under my name all over the world whenever I try to increase my value to society, whenever I try to get a job, whenever I try to move forward in life, that's what I carry. And then I started realizing, as I did over the next two years, 98 job applications. I interviewed all over this country and nobody would hire me. Nobody. So I was, I was having to reach out to my, my pension to live off of it to provide for my family because nobody would hire me. And I didn't understand why they wouldn't hire me until I realized what we do to people is, is not only do we release them from their job, but then we take their name, the only thing that's really given us in our life, our God-given name, and we destroy it. And then you don't have any opportunities. And so the ability for them to enhance and inflame these causes us to fight an uphill battle at our level. My son, I do remember him crying. I don't think my daughter understood. Um, and I think the feeling was, okay, you know, what's next? That, that's always what our thinking was, what, what's next? Uh, I think it was a lot of a blur being down there, um, being stuck in our house, um, going to the mall and some guy turning around and saying, oh, you're that guy. Um, and it wasn't a friendly, oh, you're that guy. You know, it used to be, oh, you're the guy that travels with, you know, coach. Um, and this was not. It's almost like, I compare it to a lot of people when I talk about it, I compare it to being what a convicted child pedophile is, right? You're labeled and you're that guy. Except they did something illegal. The police didn't do anything illegal. I made a decision that night that had to be made and I'm treated at that level. Uh, someone even wrote an article that uh, we were this bad family. Um, another girl at a park from the newspaper took pictures of us and said, um, and wrote an article, you know, about the shooting. So we couldn't leave the house. I think that the worst part of all of that is when he couldn't get a job. We felt like we couldn't do it here. Everything, the, our whole history was following us. We wanted to change our names. Um, you sell your wedding ring. You've got two weeks left of your rent. And you're thinking of the family who's going to take your children and that you know they do a good job and you and your husband are just going to leave and try to make ends meet. So I had to leave. So I move over to the town I currently live in. And I have no desire to do police work. Who would? Who wants to do police work after the thing you put your heart and soul into for almost 18 years is destroyed and now your name's destroyed? So I moved over here and I thought, well, I'll, I'll get a part-time job. I'll get a job to try to, to see what I can do over here. So I'd gotten a little contract job here and there doing little stuff. And so I went down to a local marina and I said, I want to go to work for y'all. I've always wanted to work at a marina. I was in the Navy. I thought, what a great job. And they said, they said, uh, well, you know, this thing on the internet is a concern to us. I'm like, all I'm doing is tying up boats and talking to people. So they hired me part-time. They said, we'll hire you part-time and see how it goes. So there I was, my kid's first day at school. My kids come down to see me. And I am, I am on the dock with a water hose washing off bird poop off a dock. That's my job. 
So my son, who was a freshman in high school, who saw his dad doing all these things and making all these decisions and running these big events and running events with you know, 250 cops and 100,000 attendees and traveling the country and speaking all over the place, is standing there washing bird crap off of a dock. That's his job. And I kept trying to get jobs and I kept trying to get jobs and I kept thinking, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? So I ran into some administrators at a local agency here they asked me about my background. I told them what's going on. They said, if you ever want to come work for us, work for us. And I had to go back to police work. And I had this somber response, so I had to go back to police work. But I did. I mean, you know, if you're the manager, you don't want to go back and stock the shelves. You know, if you're the CEO, you don't want to go back and sweep the floors. And when you're at a level where you're starting to move forward in life and life's going to give you rewards for all your effort and you sacrifice your, your time with your spouse and your time with your kids and you put in all your effort, it didn't change because I was stealing from the kitty whenever I was in the house checking on a burglary call. No, it changed because we make a law enforcement decision that has to be made that everybody else has all this time to evaluate and you lose not your job, not your home and family situation, the ability to gain employment, the ability to provide for your family, and then you go back to where you started 20 years earlier. And something has to change. You think that when you go through something like this, that if it could just give someone hope, <laughs> um, purpose to continue, um, not to seek revenge, to just hang in there. If someone can get hope for all this, it was worth it. I always say this when I speak. I always tell people that every human being has dealt a deck of cards. We all have a deck of cards right now. My question to you is, where is your deck of cards? Is it in your back pocket? Or do you pull out those cards and you throw down, I was fired, I was treated this way, I had this problem, my child had this issue, my wife had this issue, I had these issues. Did you lay all your cards out so people can learn? Do we use our deck of cards to impact our society? And I challenge people to do that. We're all gonna get kicked. It's not the falling that hurts. It's the fight to get back to the top. I'm here with Richard Baxter, the founder of Racism Stinks, and Shelly Free, the outreach coordinator of Racism Stinks. How are we doing? Good, good, good. Hey, now listen, we're going to get into why this organization is here, what brought you here today, but before we do that, I've got to ask, because uh, Richard, we've known each other for a couple of years now, you've been mm -hmm. on the show before, be sure to check that show out. If you if you if you hadn't caught that, it's been several months, last but you've got September. last September. It's because you watch it all the time, right? You know, it's, <laughs> it, it's that awesome. But it was good. But we're going to get into some different things today. But Shelly, we've never met, so I'm just curious. How did you two meet, and what brings both of you here today? Well, social media. <laughs> we met on Facebook. We met on Facebook, um, doing the work that I'm doing, and we got introduced through Facebook. Mm -hmm. and so, and we met in person, I wanted to go to a funeral that was happening for a law enforcement officer. A downed officer. Yeah, an yeah. yeah, officer that was killed. And um, it was a really crazy situation to me, you know what I mean? And I wanted somebody to come with me, so I asked people on Facebook, and we had just became Facebook friends. Right. And she was like, okay, I'll go with you, you know what I mean? It was like- You usually like, get in a car with strangers? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking, you know what I mean? But um, it worked out great, you know leap what I mean? Faith. Leap, leap of faith. Leap of faith. Well, that's I mean? awesome. She checked me out on Facebook and seen <laughs> what I was about, what I was doing, right. and something that she could buy into and, and believe with her values. Well, with well. that said, Shelly, what brought you to Racism Things? And we're going to talk about the organization itself, but what got your interest here? Why do you stay here today supporting this great organization? Well, honestly, I feel like a lot of causes, people have a hard time getting behind until it affects them personally. Yeah. And I hate to say that I only woke up because it affected me personally, but I have a biracial niece and nephew. Mm -hmm. And some of the things I had seen people in my community saying or doing toward the black community, I pictured these little babies being grown ups and being talked to that way. Right. And that's not okay. Right. And so I already was calling it out as I saw it. Yeah. And I made so many friends as of you course, can imagine. Of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if I saw it, I said it. 
And so it just so happened that that's what he was working on as well. That's kind of what Richard does. He sees it, he says it. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, what is it about just being honest that sets some people off? I'll just throw that out to either one of you. I mean, because I know, I know, I know Shelly, that's, that's what you were before you came here. And Richard, I know you for a couple of years. That's what you're like. That's what kind of attracts me to you. Uh, not in that way, that's just your thing. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, you're, yeah. you're a guy. What I like so much about you is, is I mean, you're just honest with all the issues. You're not one-sided or you're not biased. You're just completely honest with all the issues. You know, you, you're not just, you, and you don't attack people. You know, you, you're, you're the guy that is like, okay, I think there may be a problem here, but let's look into it. Let's look at the facts. Let me get some education. Uh, let me get some training. I know for a fact you've gone on ride-alongs and you're, yeah. you're inquired about the Citizens Police Academy and you're trying to educate yourself. And we have dialogue all the time. You'll ask me a question and I'll answer it. And to me, that kind of works. Why do other people have such a hard time doing that? I feel for, we want to make change, right? We, we all think that there's, there's a disconnect between the community and the police somewhere, mm -hmm. and we're trying to make some change. And to really make this change, I can't be somebody who is like, okay, I'm mad at you, I don't want to hear anything you have to do, I don't want to see anything from your side. Mm -hmm. How am I, that's, you're going to turn the other side off. You're going to yeah. turn that person off. Yeah. You can't come to me like that and expect me to respond to you mm -hmm. and say, okay, I hate you, Baxter. I hate you, Richard. I don't like anything you're doing. You're doing everything wrong. Right. Now I want you to listen to me. Right. I'm not going to make any sense, I'm not gonna listen to you. So I think like that. You know what I mean? I'm not going to. So well, what I love about racism stinks, and I know I keep saying I'm going to let you talk about it in a minute, but I can't get this out. <laughs> I got to get this out of my head, is your organization seems to be so much more cerebral. Like, mm -hmm. Like you want to make change, you think there needs to be effective change, and I, I agree with you. I think that we all need to be working towards changing things for the better for everybody. But you want to do it in such a cerebral way where it makes sense for everybody. You're not just shooting from the hip from emotions. You're not just using anger. Because as you said, that's not going to do any good, but you have a real meticulous way of doing things, of getting all the facts, of getting both sides together. That's why I think you're having so much success. And so I'm just going to ask you, tell us about Racism Stinks and uh, why you decided to call it that, because it's obviously a unique, pretty cool little name. That's when we first met, mm -hmm. that's what attracted, I didn't even know you, but when I said, when you called me up and said, I'm the founder of Racism Stinks, I go, I don't know who you are, but I like that name, <laughs> yeah. and let's hook up. And so we, we, we met up, I'll never, I'll never forget, it was, a, it was a great sunny day, we, we mm -hmm. took a bunch of pictures together, and you yep. put them on social yep. media, and we introduced ourselves, and it's been, I think, a friendship ever since. Yep. And um, so tell us about what made you form the organization. Starting Racism Stinks, it started when there was the Mike Brown situation was happening. Trayvon Martin had already been shot. Um, I was the VP of African American Student Association at TCC. We, college, college, yeah, yeah, yeah local college, Tulsa Community College yeah. for people who don't know. So uh, we took a trip to the Civil Rights Museum, and taking this trip to the Civil Rights Museum. Is that in Memphis? Memphis, that okay. one. Yeah, right. I know there's a couple. That's the only one I've been to. Okay, and so. I learned some things, you know what I mean, really expanded my knowledge about the civil rights movement. There were white people who sat alongside blacks at those lunch counters, getting spit on, beat up, called nigger lovers. I mean, I can, this is not a kid's show, right? I can talk. Yeah, it's on the internet. I think, I think <laughs> okay. it's been well established. People can say whatever they want on the internet. Okay, okay. you know. And so, I don't think I'm going to use that terminology, but go right ahead. Right, you know, but <laughs> sitting at table talking, you might have been called that, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. We're talking like we are today. Right. And so those people really stuck their necks out for freedoms that they already had, freedoms that, and so while the Black Lives Matter started, then the All Lives Matter came to combat that. It was like, these things are causing more division than they are helping. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want any particular race tied to an organ. I'm like, God, what am I supposed to do with all this information that's being downloaded to me? Yeah. I want, what I've seen how the allies helped in the civil rights movement, it was it was touching, very impactful yeah. to me, you know what I mean? And so I had white friends who wanted to be like, well, I want to help out in this. I don't know if, I, if I'm allowed to be in the Black Lives Matter. I don't know if I should I, can I, mm -hmm. what is my family going to say, this, that, and other. So, plus, that organization is so disjointed. Like, there's not really a true leader. It's so grassroots. Almost, It almost does a disservice to some of the cause because you don't know who the leadership is, right? You have clear leadership. Well, I'm the goal founder, set up, you know, yeah. I'm the founder, so people can reach me. Right. And you know, so with the with the Black Lives Matter and the All Lives Matter, it was just causing too much division. Uh -huh. I said, okay, what can I 
put together that can bring people together. Because it takes us all. That's one of our models. It takes us right. all, and together we will change the world. So I had to come up with something, and so I came up first with kill racism. I'm like, we're going to slap them in the mouth. And then we, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so then. That gets someone's attention, yeah. right? Maybe the FBI's attention, you right? Know, yeah, and okay. it was like, you know, somebody told me, like, you might not want to use the word kill at a time <laughs> like this. I'm like, I really do, but it's probably not in the best interest. So mm -hmm. racism stinks. Just toying with different things in my head, but I knew I wanted to use a black, I wanted to use an animal because animals, people love animals. And so I was like, this is a black and white issue. Let me think all you the You didn't think a German people. Shepherd would have done the trick? Just, <laughs> just go with the skunk? With that. No, I was like, this is, you know, because it's like, this, this always like, it seems like it's a black and white issue, even though it affects us all. Right. So I came with the penguin, the zebra, the panda, the skunk, and all that. And I had to, then once I came with the skunk, then that's how the stinks plugged into it. Yeah. And so. Well, I think from a marketing, I think you, you hit it right. I think it's memorable. And when they say it from, if, if you can remember, that's a good, that's a good thing. So I think yeah. it's very memorable what you've done. And so I got to applaud you, but I'm not the only one that's applauded. You don't know I'm going to talk about this, but I was in Oklahoma City with you when the governor gave you an award. Yes. So you're early on in this organization, around, around a year or so, right? And you get yeah. an award from the governor. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Oh, yeah, that was great. I'm thankful that you came to well, of be course. with me. Yeah. yeah, I was there with your father and uh -huh. you. and. Uh, and they give you this award, and uh, of course you're a humble guy. You're not broadcasting that. Nobody really knows about that, but I'm going to tell the world about it. <laughs> Pretty neat deal. Um, so I've already said kind of what I liked about you is you you really come from a factual viewpoint. Uh, you know, you and I we just had this conversation off camera that we could probably sit down with a beer and talk for an hour, and I bet 90% of the stuff we talk about we're going to agree with. In fact, it's probably most people in America. But it's that 10% that you don't agree with. What do you do with that? And I think exactly. what we've always done with it is, man, we've We've had a good, healthy debate. I present facts, you present facts, and we come to an agreement, and we're just adults, and we're, we leave as friends. Why cannot everyone else just do that? Because that, because we accomplish things that way. I believe. That's I believe the only way. To yeah. So, things. what is going on out there in the world when we see all this divisiveness and all this hatred? Why can we not, as a as a world, just do what you've been so successful in doing? What's in you that's not in anybody else? What's in me, huh? <laughs> well, now listen, you may not you may not believe me, but you're different. You're different in a good way. You you like I said, you really address issues in a very healthy, professional, adult way. You agree with that, right, Shelley? I do. So so why can't everybody else be like that? Well, I don't know. You're, you're, well you're a godly <laughs> I mean, man. I'm in, I'm you're a godly man. That's and true. I'm sure that, that, that is that has grounded you and given you a base to be like that. But there's other people my background okay like, you know what it is and some people don't know but I've been through some things you know and I took ownership of those things mm -hmm. you know you know I feel that some people are just against law enforcement some people are just against activism you know what I mean and yep. I feel that yep. And that's a true statement. You know no no I mean? question about it you have extremes on both sides right mm -hmm. you have activists that are just they don't even actors, they just hate cops, mm -hmm. right? And then you have uh, the other side, call it the cop world or the conservative world, whatever you want to call it, they just hate activists, yeah. you know? And so you have these two extremes, which I do not think, I want to be very clear for our audience, I do not think that is anywhere close to the majority. No, Those are extremes. No. Those are the far fringes, and it's everybody in the middle that really can make the change, but why do we focus so much? They're the loudest ones. Yeah, because they're, they're the loudest. loudest ones. Yeah, they're the loudest. And, and I, I want to give our audience a tip, because we talked about this off camera, mm -hmm. How do you know you're talking to an extremist? And we need to we need to probably write a book on this, right? And here's how. <laughs> it's because what do they do very early on? They attack people. Mm -hmm. They attack people personally. They call names. And as soon as that happens, um, the, and also they lie. That's also what is kind of the, the extremist fringe group does. And listen, that's not just here locally. That's in every city in America. We have those extremists on both sides, right? It's happened to me. I've been called names. I've been called, I'm not going to say what they were, but I've been right. called certain names and they typed them on, you know, what, what do you call them, a uh, coward behind a keyboard? Keyboard warriors. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, that's so, using some of my terminology. Yeah, the coward behind the, yeah, yeah, so, you know, I had some of them attack me and, you know, but I got thick skin, you know. I'm, well, you also, and what I've learned to do this because uh, uh, the, the lies and the attack, the personal attacks, it's not right for anybody to, to have to go through that. Mm -hmm. Hey, if I mess up, let's talk about that. I'll own up that. 
you're not going to attack me or my family personally, you know. But the other thing that I've learned through experience is you just have to ignore them. Because mm -hmm. we could, if you're not careful, you will get sucked in, right? And I think probably everybody watching this has probably had an encounter with somebody online like this. Oh, yeah. You will get sucked in and spend all of your time and energy on that extremist, mm -hmm. on that keyboard coward, right? The person that's behind a keyboard doing their thing. I, I call them the guy in the basement, in their mom's basement, yeah. just being all tough guy. They, if they were like this, they couldn't even have a conversation. Exactly. Right? And I, I have personal experience with one of these really radical people that just is out of their head and said, hey, let's talk. Let's get together and talk. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Well, of course you're not because that's, that goes deeper than personal attacks. That's actually doing what you and I do and mm -hmm. Shelly and I do is we, we have conversations. Exactly. And that's where I believe you're on to something magical here. And I've, it's really unfortunate that there's not a, literally an army of people like, like us doing this because I think some pretty cool change could happen. Uh, Shelly, you went on you went on a ride along. Shelly, I know you've been on some ride alongs. How does that change your viewpoint of everything? I'm gonna let you speak. <laughs> well, the media doesn't always play both sides, and that goes for pro police and anti police. It depends mm. on the angle of the story. And being in my community, on the streets of my community, meeting people who otherwise I wouldn't have met, you learn the difficulty and understanding diversity in your community. Mm -hmm. A lot of um, the anti-police or the pro-police reform movement wants to talk about diversity training. And that would be a hard thing to go out every day and to have to meet people from all over the world mm -hmm. in your community and to know their customs and their cultures and the things that they find offensive. You know, it's I'll stop you for a minute because I think maybe it is hard for some people, but I've always enjoyed that. That's that's I life, well. man. That's that's enjoyable, I well. and I think that is in some people's DNA. Where man, we enjoy being around different people. Right. right? Oh, I'll let you finish. I'm sorry about that. Well, that was the thing with me too, and that's why I'm drawn to this kind of work. Mm -hmm. I love interacting with cultures other than my own and learning right. about them. But some people, if they've never been in a community, they take what they've seen on the media to that community. Oh, no question. No question. Exactly. Yeah. And so we saw it after 9/11. We, we, every time we have a major instance in the media here, we see certain groups persecuted within their own communities. Mm -hmm. And it's because people don't have experience with those communities and they're just playing off what the media has fed them. Yeah, if we're not careful, the media, the media dictates what our issues mm -hmm. are. They dictate our anger, they dictate our focus. And if we're not careful, we, we buy into that, right? Yeah. And there's so much more to the world in context than just what the media tells us. And I think I think both of you have done a really good job of making sure people know that. I've seen some of your some of your Facebook chatter, online chatter, where you try to tell people some certain things. One, I said something to you one time, Richard, and I, I love I loved it because we were talking about community policing, and mm -hmm. and I said, uh, you know, there's two words in community policing, Richard. There's community and there's policing, and you kind of get that because you come from both sides of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just the police that need to, to reform. You also think that the public needs to reform and be educated. You push both sides of that coin. And I'll be honest with you, I don't see a whole lot of people doing that. Tell us why that's kind of your approach to things. I feel the community needs to be educated on police practices and what's going on with the police. During, that, during the ride along, I deal with the police. It was, it was shocking. Like there was an incident where this guy had a golf club. He's swinging the golf club. He's barricaded inside a hotel room window and he broke that window and I swear, on my life, I thought it was a gunshot. And I'm sitting in the car, not too far away, but it was so loud, boom, it sounded like a gunshot. And I thought the police were about to shoot him, mm -hmm. you know? And, but it, luckily for him, at one of the, I think it was like 11 officers, you know, right there, because he had just assaulted a woman across the street, because she was bleeding out of the face, and she was inside the, um, he was inside the, uh, right. um, the hotel room before we got there, but one thing that I, I was, the, the cop seen through the window that it was a golf club, so he let them know, like, hey, this is a golf club. They shot be, um, pepper, pepper balls in there. Mm -hmm. And the job is, is it was, it's exciting, it's risky, it's dangerous. And then when I went to the funeral, when me and Shelly went to that funeral, the guy who died, uh, um, Mr. Wade, Mr. Wade, when he, he wasn't in like in the field doing anything. He was delivering an eviction notice. Yeah, it's something that's supposed to be just a common thing, no risk at all, right? Routine. Yeah. You know, that's it, 
it's just so crazy to me. You know what I mean? It just right. it didn't. It doesn't make any sense to me. This guy's just delivering an eviction notice, mm -hmm. and this guy shoots him and and kills him. You know, and yeah. so I wanted to experience that to experience how from the other side. I can't come and say, hey, I think you guys need to do X, Y, and Z. I don't know anything about X, Y, yeah, and Z, yeah. first of all. So let me learn some things. What's going on? How do you guys live? What's going on? You know, The police are not robots. They're human beings. Yeah. They're people. These activists and these citizens who are complaining about what, whatever's going on, they're citizens. They're human beings, too. We're all people. Mm -hmm. And I want the, the people on this side and this side to know that Look at each other. We're human beings. Right. That's that's the most important thing. You know. What I mean, and we have to value life. You know. We have to value each other's life. Yeah. No. I think that's all good stuff. And and you know, I think I think you're going around the right right approach. Like I said, you know, when you look at other professions, mm -hmm. uh, banks or doctors, there aren't people that aren't banks or doctors going do this, do that, because that would be crazy. I don't know anything about being a doctor. I don't know anything about being a banker. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to demand change. So we. But so. But I think. I think in law enforcement, we are bound by the citizens. We work for the citizens. I believe in that. We're taxpayers pay their taxes, and I believe we should serve the community. We should serve citizens, and I think citizens should be able to ask questions. Definitely. We should give answers, mm -hmm. and then if citizens don't like something, they should be able to vocalize that. We should be talking about that and change that if it makes things better. But I think there's a way to do that, and the way to do that is, is as you do. I mean, you are very articulate and professional about it. And uh, I think that's good stuff. Now, you, your organization does a lot of neat stuff. We're going to talk about the community stuff you're doing and the training you're doing, but you've got a big fundraiser coming up uh -huh. uh, this weekend. Uh, and Saturday. so talk to us about the fundraiser, why you decided to do a 5K run, and, and kind of the historic, the historic aspect with that. Well, we're doing our third annual Race Against Racism, the Skunk Run. Yep. And so we're doing that in... We first started the first time. It's, it's a 3K now. It was a 5K, the very first one, and we did at La Fortune Park. So people like me could run the 3K. You lower it from a man. 5K. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're, we, the whole thing is, is that we want to unite our community. Right here, we're in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're the worst racial massacre, racial atrocity happening. In and our we're pretty country. segregated in the yes, city. Yes, yeah. definitely. I kind of attribute this to Milwaukee is very segregated, I believe, and we're, we're very similar. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're a very segregated city, and I'm sure historically it has something to do with all this stuff that happened, so tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, well, the the massacre happened in 1921, and it was, um, it was just a, it, I, I don't know, I wasn't there, but you know what I mean? But <laughs> That'd be was, crazy. You know what I mean? But it was a, it was a misunderstanding, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it was some kind of misunderstanding. Imagine that, what still goes on today, right? You Misunderstandings, know? yeah. I mean, I know the story, and yeah. I don't want to just delve all into the right. story about the elevator and all this other yeah. stuff, but it ended up that, you know, there was a section, a business district uptown. This is during segregation, so the, um, they had a black side of town, a white side of town, mm -hmm. and the black side of town got destroyed you know during this whole entire process the thing that happened and so we're actually going running through we have a historian from TU You're running through these areas we're, yeah. we're starting in the Brady district going through the Greenwood district and we're gonna tour through right through where all the destruction happened nice and there's what and we end at Guthrie Green which is a, a park downtown and so we're going to you know explain about what happened how we're moving forward. This is our community coming together, all races, all cultures coming together, mm -hmm. uniting as one and symbolically moving forward down this road where the destruction happened and we're rewriting our history now, yeah. you know? That's that's good stuff and this has evolved through the time. So if people wanted to get involved in this and I'm gonna encourage our audience, you may not be in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but they can still register for the race. It oh, supports yeah. your organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to encourage them to do that. Tell them wh where they need to go to register for the race. Hopefully, if you're in the area, you can show up to that. Be sure to come up and, and let you know that you heard about it here. But where can they register for that? You can go online to racismstinks.com. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to go straight to our ticket vendor, it's Eventbrite. And you can just type in Skunk Run, and it pops okay. right up. But yeah, Eventbrite's really easy to use. But on, on Racism Stinks, I'm sure it goes straight to Eventbrite. Yes, yep. right? There's a tab, or you can go on the home page and register. That's good stuff. I'm going to I'm gonna register. I can't be there. I don't. You don't know that yet. My <laughs> my my. Uh, I've got to be. I've got to be in a family event. I'll tell you off camera okay. what that is. That's kind of a semi emergency that occurred. But I'm going to register for the race, and I'm going to challenge everybody out there in law enforcement to register for the race. And you're going to go. I'm not. I'm not going to be there. I don't care. Register for the race. 
because it's going to support some of the great programs that you're going to tell me about here in a minute. So I know you're big into training and education. You talked about that. What do you have planned and what are you developing as far as that goes? On June 9th, we're going to do our first CTI, Community Training Initiative. And we're going to be training people in our community how to respond when faced with law enforcement in various situations, mm -hmm. you know? Because law enforcement, people say, I heard, I heard people say, well, if you're afraid, you shouldn't be on the job. You shouldn't be in law enforcement. You shouldn't be a police officer. It goes back to that robot thing, right? Exactly, yeah. you know what I mean? So law enforcement are human beings. And going to those situations I just explained about the guy swinging that golf club and those officers behind there didn't know what they heard, you know what I mean? All they heard was the loud bang, just like right. I heard. And I'm like, oh, shoot, they're about to be a shooter. Yeah. And then going to the funeral, seeing the guy, seeing his family and seeing you know all the people who came out, for an eviction notice, you know? I've never served an eviction notice, I've never been served one, but right. I mean, it's a simple thing. I've been served papers before, you know what I mean, for legal action, I work in the law, at a law firm. And, and of course, in that instance, we ran that story and we didn't play the video completely because there was body camera footage of that. Is that happened like that? It was a split, literally, the guy goes, I'm gonna go back to the house and get some paperwork. The guy literally comes out and it was just like that. And it was just horrible, tragic that you know. Mm -hmm. There's no way that that officer got up that morning thinking, yeah. "This is going to be my last morning." And uh, that's that's you know, you said something you know that police and police and activists both are not robots; they're humans. And that's what I think should be a take. One of the takeaways from today's show is is I don't think law enforcement gets enough credit for just being a human being. Mm -hmm. You know, we we are people do kind of look at us. They kind of believe what TV shows them or Hollywood, and they kind of think that we're somehow Superman and we can dodge bullets and we can do this. That's not the case. We're just like, just like you thought that was a gunshot. There could have been a police on the scene that thought that was a gunshot. I'm sure. You I'm know, sure and so did. and so we're everyone's just human, and there doesn't ever seem to be any grace given to really anybody anymore in this country. On I mean, sometimes mistakes could happen, yeah. right? And we need to train. We need to do all we can. And you're part of this training program, and and we need to do everything we can to be perfect. But as long as we're humans, there's going to be there's going to there's going to be imperfections. Mm -hmm. Especially we're robots. And, and, well, especially yeah. in high levels of stress. Mm -hmm. Everybody deals with that. Whether it's firefighters, well, we're not really firefighters, but the military. Yeah. But the military, all every job with high level, including doctors and nurses. You know, the 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 uh, so-called you know accident rate in the doctor profession is tremendous, just through malpractice oh, and yeah. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So anytime you 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 impose stress onto human beings, there's going to be there's going to be some things that occur, and we can have debates all day long on whether that should have occurred or shouldn't have occurred, but at the end of the day, the higher the stress the situation, of course, you, you were, I guess, fortunate to experience one yourself on a ride along. That didn't always happen. Uh, you can go days without that kind of stress, and you got a day one, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you learn from just personal experience that it's a little different than sitting behind the old keyboard that so many people do, and so I think that brings a lot of value. So you kind of built some of your training, and you'll talk about some of that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we want people to know uh, they're not robots. Like you said, that's a big right. part of it. And when an officer comes, they, they don't know what they're walking into. You know what I mean? It could be just a traffic ticket. It could be this guy has is wanted for six murders, and you never know. You know right. what I mean? So they're on a particular type of mind frame. You know a stat that nobody knows, nobody really knows about? We die every year, law enforcement, going to abandoned car calls. You believe that? You get a call, abandoned car, okay? You think, well, it's just a, a car that's been put on the side of the road or abandoned car. And and what happens is, is, is somebody's abandoned that car, maybe uh, one of the instances I'm thinking of, I think it was Indiana, where the guy did abandon his car. He walked a little belt on the road, but he had murder warrants. Mm. So the cop didn't know it. So he's like, hey, is this your car? And it just happens that quick, you know? So we die going to rave this, noise complaint calls, just a noise complaint. Like loud music and yeah, stuff? Yeah, loud music call. We, we have died going to those because we think it's one thing, and you get there, and it's completely something else, just like the, uh, the funeral you went to, yeah. right? And so uh, it, that's what makes what you're doing so important because it gives a broader contextual perspective of it. And that's why, by the way, I believe law enforcement should be trained at the highest level possible. Mm -hmm. At the highest level possible. Most states, uh, I think people that watch your show know I'm probably not a – San Francisco 49er fan, and I'm not particularly a Colin Kaepernick fan. It's not because he can't win games. It's just because I think he kind of rushed to conclusions and judgments 
and didn't ask very many questions before he did what he did. You know, that's just the way I feel. That's my opinion. But one thing he said was right. I think he'd be proud of me for saying this. Not that he's watching. But if he is, <laughs> Colin, how are you doing? If he is watching. One, one, tag is one, watching. one thing he said was right. Is he said, most policemen in this country do not get very much training. Now, let me tell you. In most departments, he's right. And there, there's people in our audience that know he's right mm -hmm. and that we have to do all we can as lawster.com, as racism stinks, to up the training in law enforcement as high as possible. And I've, I have been very honored and proud to be pushing that for many, many years around the country. And we need more training. The more training, the better. Well, I think it's going to come if we keep on doing discussions like this and talking to the right people and moving up the right. ladder. I have a meeting um, coming up with the FOP director soon, like in a week after I come back. From That's fraternal order of police. Yes. Union stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you okay. Now we're going to get everybody going, <laughs> going big time. Yeah, you know what I mean? So we're, we're, we're working on making positive change for mm -hmm. all of us. Unity. It takes us all, you know what I mean? Well, I, I guess as we're coming to the end of this, and I, I can't thank you both enough for being here, I guess I have to ask, are there people, because this all makes sense to me, people go, well, I, I mean, I'll just tell you, I had, I had a couple guys call me yesterday because we market the show early in the week and we had your organization up there, like, well, what are you doing, what are you doing talking about this stuff? And I go, man, it makes sense. But of course, they're drawing from the negative experiences, right, yeah. that, that, that is seen out there in the media. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to me, it just makes sense. Uh, you know, that we all have to work together. We all have to, I personally want to be involved in a profession that's its most ethical and most professional there is. Who wouldn't want that, right? Exactly. I know you, both of you are in the legal field, mm -hmm. and you want that for the legal field. you got a long ways to go as lawyers, by the way. You yeah. need to keep working at it. But, um, <laughs> <Getting there. laughs> you are, you are. But, but it just makes sense. Tell me this. Why is it that it seems like so many people don't agree with that? Is it just personal agendas? Is it, is it, well, they're not doing it my way, so I'm doing it the other way? Why, why does it seem like we're on kind of this island, Richard and Shelley, and nobody wants to join our island, even though it's a fun island? Tell me. <laughs> because the phrase, you said it earlier, that's how we've always done it. Mm. It's the norms of our culture. It's the norms of society. Mm. It's how we've always done it. And if you're one of those people that that's worked for you, you don't see a reason to change it. But if you're one of those people that it hasn't, it's hard to give someone else your perspective unless you sit down and have those cerebral conversations mm -hmm. and explain what you've been through. That's work though, isn't it? It's hard work. Just it like takes, I was telling you, they yeah. want you to explain this so quickly and I told them, I said, I cannot give you the problem in a Google snippet. Like yeah. we have to have a sit down conversation right. and talk about issues or we're not going to agree. We're just yelling statements back. I have a, um, a phrase that I use for that. I said, this is not liposuction, it's diet and exercise. Long term, mm -hmm. it's yeah. diet and exercise. You know, it's good people stuff. don't want to do that. They want to get. Right. They want to go get the tummy cut. They want to get it cut out. This is diet and exercise. That's good stuff. Uh, you know who has figured this out? Basketball. Let me <laughs> let me tell you why. Uh, my son plays competitive basketball, mm -hmm. and this is going to shock you, but my son's white. <laughs> and. Uh, and I go to these basketball tournaments. I'm kind of new to these basketball tournaments. These kind of AAU type basketball no, tournaments with lots of kids, there. right? And, uh, and so I'm sort of new to that environment. So I walk into these gyms, anywhere in the country where we may be, and what do I see? I see black kids and white kids and Hispanic kids, black parents, white parents, Hispanic parents, maybe some other races, but that's mainly what I see, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's no hatred, there's no anger, there's no agendas, there's, everybody is just getting along. Well, Unless you're on the other side. No, no. <laughs> e even then, I, I see opposing players, opposing parents, are helping oh, each good other. Oh, sportsmanship. Yeah, yeah. That, that is always taught. Mm -hmm. They figured it out. They're there for the kids and for the. They're there in love, like we had yeah. talked about earlier. Yeah, isn't that? It's amazing stuff. And honestly, I love it. I can't. I'm like, I look out there and I think, why can't everybody just be like this? You know, I, I know. We're not going to always agree because it would be a boring place if we all agree, right? I mean, we're, you know, True. but but. Why can't we just disagree in love? Just like you see out there at the basketball court or wherever else. So that's why I love what you're doing. I can't say it enough. We'll have you back on because I know you're going to be doing some really cool stuff in the future. I think you may not know this. I know your, your, your organization is relatively new. I think this is the national model, Richard and Shelley. I think you're doing something that the entire country needs to embrace. I think you need to have chapters all over this country. Uh, we're going to do all we can to help you with that. Uh, and before we leave, I'll just kind of give the floor to you. Is there anything you'd like to tell our audience 
uh, before we get out of here. Now, listen, we had a heck of a show. Don't run it now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say anything crazy. No, I'm just messing no. with you. What do you got? Well, I just want to tell you thank you once again for allowing us to come on this platform, spreading the message. You know, thank you for believing, you know, in the message. And the audience members who are listening and, you know, some, some people who maybe it came at you a different way other than like why are you putting him on and why are you doing that you know we're working for a positive change for mm -hmm. all of all of us involved we're i want i always stress the fact that you know these activists got to remember that the police are not going anywhere we need the police and the police have to know that the citizens the activists they're not going anywhere we're going to be here together we have to f figure out a way to mm -hmm. work together right good stuff. Shelly, thank you. Well, thank you. What he said was really good. I was just going to mention our Facebook page. Yeah, go ahead. Because that's where we post all of our events at. Mm -hmm. It's um, facebook.com backslash skunk life Tulsa. Okay. And uh, we do weekly meetings. We've got all that listed up there. We do speaking engagements in schools. We've got all that listed and Going as well as our Chicago. race. And I love yeah. what you said about you have a weekly meeting. I think it's every Sunday and you basically say, hey, don't be arguing if you don't want to come to our meetings. Don't be complaining. Come on yeah. out. So you're, you're offering for everybody. I tried to come this week. I got busy, but I'm going to be there as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good stuff. Richard Baxter, Shelly Free. It's incredible stuff what you're doing. We can't thank you enough for coming on Lost or Live. I'm sure we'll see you soon, and we'll, we'll tell the world everything you're doing. And thank you for joining us. This is an incredible episode. It's an important episode. Community policing, stopping racism, unbiased stuff. I love it. We're going to continue to bring you the faces of what I believe can really change the world. So thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.